Well, I said that this was a positive message. It may not start that way, but the first verse doesn't start that way. But it is a message of hope, and I hope that you'll hang in there with me, because I have great joy in declaring it to you today. The Christian scriptures tell us that in the ancient past, God gave a command to humanity. It was the very first command. According to Jewish tradition, it's the first of 613 commandments God gave to the people in the Torah, in the Law of Moses, in the first five books of the Bible. And it was the command to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the earth and to subdue it. And humanity did it. However, rather than proceeding to fulfill those commands in submission to God, humanity first did that in rebellion against God. And God declared his evaluation of humanity's accomplishments in in Genesis chapter 6, beginning in verse 5. The scriptures say this, The Lord saw that the wickedness of mankind, of humankind, was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the word evil in Hebrew is not like the category of evil like the Greeks thought of. Evil means they were always seeking to do harm to others. Evil are things that you receive as harmful, hurtful things. And that's what he means. There was violence in their hearts. So the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Then the Lord said, I will wipe out humankind whom I have created from the face of the land, humankind and animals as well, and crawling things and the birds of the sky. For I am sorry. Another way of translating that word is, I repent that I have made them. God executed his judgment on that generation by undoing his acts of creation in the beginning. And you and I talked about this a few weeks ago. God shrunk the habitable space that he had carved out between the waters. What the Hebrew people call the Shemaim, what we call the heavens, sometimes the sky, which is not as good a translation. Until only space enough for an ark was left. On that ark, God preserved a small sampling of the life that had once filled the earth, including one human family, the family of Noah. Afterwards, God reestablished the boundaries he had set prior to the flood, and he removed the waters from the Shemaim, from the heavens, allowing the heavens to expand and the earth to reemerge from the waters. And once Noah and his family and the preserved animals left the ark, We read the following. This is also from the book of Genesis in chapter 8, beginning in verse 20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every kind of clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. The Lord smelled the soothing aroma. It's not that God likes the smell of burning meat. It's the relationship that this signifies that is important to God. The Lord smelled the smoothing aroma and the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man. For the intent of human hearts is evil from their youth. I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. That's sometimes called the covenant of Noah. And there's more to it, but that's the beginning of it. What God promised in these verses is twofold, if you paid attention to what God said. First, From that day forward, God would hold humanity alone accountable for their sins. In the flood, God had cursed all life on earth. He promised in these verses he would never do that again, that humanity alone would remain accountable for their wickedness on the earth. Second, God promised to be faithful in maintaining the orderliness of creation for as long as the earth remains. We discussed God's love last week, God's chesed in Hebrew, God's steadfast loyalty. This promise that he made to Noah is an expression of his chesed, of his love. In the flood, God allowed the chaos of original creation, the waters, remember that's another Hebrew word we've learned together, the ma'im in Hebrew, to overwhelm the habitable space he had created for us. After the great flood, God promised to maintain the barrier between the earth and the heavens and the waters for as long as the earth remains. In other words, God's promise was that the next time he allowed the waters to flood the earth, it would be the end of the earth. 
The Apostle Peter explains this same truth in the following way. This is in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3-7. through 7. It's the same thing that we just read in Genesis, but from a slightly more New Testament perspective. Peter wrote this, Know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue just as they were from the beginning of creation. You can hear every scientist on earth saying that, right? Oh, the earth goes as it goes. Nothing new under the sun. Everything that has happened is happening again. There's nothing new. We've seen this before. Maybe this is worse. Maybe closer to give. But it's the same. It's always been the same. Nobody's coming to save us. We're on our own, right? You can hear the people say that. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water. We spent a whole week on that, right? Out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed by being flooded with water. But by his word, that's the promise to Noah, that's what he means by his word. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly people. This promise of God has laid the foundation of the Christian hope of the new heavens and the new earth. As the Apostle Peter continues just a few verses later in 2 Peter, in chapter 3, verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be discovered. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat? But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. I know I said it was a hopeful message. It doesn't sound hopeful. But for those who are God's people, what I just said is the greatest news ever declared. If it's bad news, it tells us about our relationship with God. These realities frame our view of history as Christians. We know that God will maintain the earth until its appointed end. How do we know that? Because God is chesed. Because God is love, we know that we can trust this promise he made to Noah. However, God also has promised that he will finally judge the wickedness of the earth and destroy this creation. Because God is chesed, because God is love, we know that we can trust that promise as well. I went to seminary with a student who thought that the hope of the new heavens and the new earth was that this earth would be renewed and we would get to live on it in perfect peace. And he was going around looking at mansions on the ocean, picking which one he was going to live in. That's foolishness. Now what I said about the destruction of the earth, that's pretty depressing, right? Well, the narrative of the flood in Genesis introduces us to another reality, which is the real source of the hope we're talking about. A reality that is the hope of all who seek God in this place. God spared Noah and his family. God spared a remnant. Why did God spare Noah and his family? Well, Genesis tells us that. You don't have to guess as to why he did it. This is in Genesis chapter 6, verse 8. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Why? Was Noah perfect? Was Noah wise? No, it tells us right here. What made him righteous? What made him blameless? Noah walked with God. Noah walked with God. This is another way for the Hebrew people to say Noah had faith. As we discussed last week, faith for those who wrote the Hebrew Bible has feet. Jesus called his disciples to the same faith as that of Noah when he said, this is Luke 9, 23, we've read it twice before in this series, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. They must walk with Jesus. To survive God's judgment as Noah, we must walk with God. 
To put it in the terms of the New Testament, we must have faith in Jesus. We must follow Jesus. In Noah and his family, God spared a remnant. And that tells us something about God. Something that has been true from that day to this. God's judgment is never total. God does not destroy the faithful with the wicked. God always preserves a remnant. Always. God's judgment is not arbitrary. It's not indifferent. It's not calloused. It's not cruel. It is specific. This is the great hope of the prophecies of Amos. This very hope that we've been talking about, that God spares a remnant, is the hope of Amos. And it's the subject of the final verses of the book. So if you have access to a Bible, I invite you to turn with me to the book of Amos. For a bit of context, I'm going to start reading in verse 10. Amos chapter 9, beginning in verse 10, and I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. The text says this, All the sinners of my people will die by the sword. Those who say the catastrophe will not overtake or confront us. Did you hear that in 2 Peter? In the last days, people will say, where's this coming he talked about? No devastation is going to come on us. There's nobody coming to get you. It's foolishness. The earth goes as it's always gone, right? That's exactly, it's the same. Peter and Amos are the same. But here's the hope. Verse 11. On that day, I will raise up the fallen shelter of David and wall up its gaps. I will also raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, so that they may possess the remnant of Eden and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman will overtake the reaper, and the one who treads grapes will overtake him who sows the seed, when the mountains will drip grape juice and all the hills will come apart. If you're not getting it here, the harvest will not be taken in and they'll be laying more seed. It will be so productive that it's like the harvest never ends. That's what he's talking about. I will also restore the fortunes of my people Israel and they will rebuild the desolated cities and live in them. They will also plant vineyards and drink their wine and make gardens and eat their fruit. I will also plant them on their land and they will not be uprooted again from their land, which I have given them, says the Lord, your God. What Amos has essentially described is a bringing together again the story of the flood in his time. It's a recapitulation of the flood. But instead of only one family being preserved, God has declared through Amos that a people will be preserved. When we see the same image in the book of Revelation, the throng that gathers around God's throne is numberless. Amos does not tell us how this remnant will be set apart from the rest. Presumably in his time, when the people heard this message, they would have assumed that faithfulness to the covenant of Sinai is what it would mean to walk with God. In the wake of Jesus, we know now that the remnant is preserved by faith in Jesus by following Jesus, by walking with Jesus. This is the good news of the scriptures, Old Testament and new. By his grace, God has preserved a remnant on the earth. In fact, all of God's interventions in history, beginning with Abraham, were for this purpose. So that when he finally destroyed the earth, there would be a people preserved and saved from the destruction. One family was not enough to satisfy God's desire. We might ask ourselves, why did he spare the earth in the flood? There were not enough people who walked with God. Noah's family was not enough for him. And so he delayed the destruction of the earth. That's all he's done. He's delayed it. So that more could come. That is the mercy of God. God revealed this to Isaiah. And Isaiah spoke it to Israel. This is in Isaiah chapter 49, verses 5 through 6. And we know now that the one Isaiah is talking about, the suffering servant of God, is Jesus. So you have to hear Jesus in this, but Isaiah was saying it hundreds of years before Jesus was born. Isaiah 49, verse 5. And now says the Lord, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, we know this now as Jesus, to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel might be gathered to him. For I'm honored in the sight of the Lord, and God is my strength. He says... It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the protected ones of Israel. One family is not enough. 
I will also make you a light to the nations, so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. The New Testament authors call this the question of why God spared Noah, why he didn't just wipe everything out at the beginning. They call this a great mystery, never before revealed until the ministry of Jesus. A mystery long hidden, that one family of the earth was not enough for the Lord. He wanted a remnant preserved from all nations on earth. He wanted, as Jesus told the parable, his house to be full. Jesus said to the disciples that he would not return until the full number of Gentiles had come in. You remember? The Apostle Paul explains this as the great mystery of the gospel. This is Ephesians chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my, this is Paul speaking, my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to humankind, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. The great mystery of the gospel is that one family was not enough for God. And so he delayed his judgment on the earth. He postponed it, that his house might be full. It's not only the great hope of the gospel of Jesus, it's the great hope of Amos and of all the prophets as well, that God would spare a remnant of his people, that God would call his people back from exile, that God would plant them in a pleasant and permanent land from which they would never again be uprooted. Now most of the people in Amos' day would have heard those promises as being fulfilled on this earth in this present reality. Like my seminary friend, they would have walked around wondering what house they would have gotten. But the promise, in fact, even in Amos, is of the new heavens and the new earth. The book of Revelation describes this new creation in terms which should be more familiar to us now that we've been through this series in Amos than it might have been before. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 4, describe the same scene as Amos in chapter 9, verses 11 to 15. It says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among the people, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be among them, and he will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Did you catch that phrase, mysterious phrase? There is no longer any sea. Now, for those of you who like the water, that's dismal news, right? I I remember a person once said to me, there's no night in heaven, I don't get to sleep. Apparently, they love to sleep. Sometimes heaven describes things in ways we don't like. But we're not talking there about the ocean, as you know it, or Lake Otisco or something like that. We're talking about the Mayim, the waters. There's no longer any sea. Waters, the waters that surround the habitable space that God created for life, the waters that were allowed to invade the earth and destroy it in the flood, the waters that seek to undo all the work that God has done, the waters with whom fallen humanity conspires to bring death into God's good world. In the new heavens and the new earth, there are no waters. They are permanent the new heavens and the new earth. They're lasting, they are eternal, they are secure, they are not under threat as we are. This is the hope of all who place faith in Jesus, of all who follow Jesus, of all who walk with God. One day, we will pass through the waters and arrive in a promised land without them. Praise be to God. But before we get too excited, We must remember that the remnant is not all who have lived. The Bible does not teach universalism. This is why I read Amos chapter 9 verse 10, to remind us that all the sinners of my people will die by the sword before that day comes. Amos puts that warning first. The book of Revelation puts it second. 
Let's read together the very next verses. Right after that great hope we just read in Revelation 21, 1 through 4, it's followed here in verse 5 with these words. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give water to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. The one who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and sexually immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The promises of God are not good news for all people. That's actually a misquote of what the angel said. The promises of God are dreadful news for those who will not repent, who will not trust Jesus, who will not deny themselves, take up their crosses and follow Jesus, who refuse to walk with God. Amos' message and the message of the New Testament are the same in this respect. Those who will not trust Jesus by embracing his teachings and following in his footsteps are akin to those who would not trust the covenant of Sinai in the First Testament. Both are headed in the way of all flesh. Both are headed back to the waters, or to use the language of Genesis, back to the dust from whence they came. That must be said. But it's not hopeless because that is not God's will. And anyone who says God's will is always done has not read or understood the scriptures. Because the scriptures tell us that God wills that none perish. And yet, people do perish. This is 2 Peter chapter 3. Now this is right between the two verses we read. So it's the same context we just read. Warning that the earth was going to be destroyed and we have to live holy. Right in the middle, and I saved it for now so we could read the hope. This is 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 8. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. God is not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. That heart of God is the reason he did not destroy the whole earth in the flood originally, but he paused his destruction. He brought the waters almost to the brink, but he relented and showed mercy and allowed Noah and those on the ark to survive. Why did he do it? Because he is not slow, as some understand slowness. He wants none to perish, but all to come to eternal life. He was not ready to give up on the earth. It's also the mystery of why we have waited 2,000 years for Jesus to return. Why he has waited so long that the world has come to believe that he doesn't even exist. Why has God allowed such a thing? Why not show himself? Why not come back? Why so long? Maybe it's a myth. It's not a myth. It's mercy. He still has not given up on us. Because the day he returns, there is no more opportunity. God is not only a God of chesed, of steadfast loyalty, He's also a God of mercy and compassion. And that is why we wait. As in the days of Amos, many in this world, Christians and non-Christians alike, do not want to deny themselves. They do not want to take up crosses and follow Jesus. They just don't want to do it. And for non-Christians... They've convinced themselves that they can save themselves. For non-Christians, salvation is by works, by human effort. If there is a God, then they say humans have discovered many ways to God. And it's left to us, to you and me individually, to decide which of the ways of God discovered by humanity are best for us. Maybe for our personality, maybe for our culture, whatever it is, we decide... We have discovered the ways, and we decide which ones to walk in. 
For many non-Christians, the way to God is discovered by us, chosen by us, and navigated by us. We save ourselves by choosing the way to God. It's salvation by works. For other non-Christians, eternal life is dependent on how we compare to other people. In terms of some set of universal norms of good and evil. Well, as long as I'm better than Johnny, I'll be all right. I'm not a bad person. Look at how, what people do. I don't do those things. That must be fine. This, too, is salvation by works. And for other non-Christians, there is no God, nor is there eternal life. So all we have is this life. For such folks, the best we can do is make the best of the time we've been given. This life, as they say, is heaven or hell depending on the choices we make and our responses to the eventualities of our lives. And this too is salvation by works. For non-Christians, one's destiny is in their own hands. And that's not surprising, because that's what it means to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, to be free of God. It's no wonder that those free of Him value their independence and their autonomy. That is the God they worship. It's why we lost relationship with God in the beginning. If they're correct, then humanity must save themselves. And I'm a sci-fi person. If you know me well, most of you don't quite yet. And I'd be careful not to use illustrations from Star Trek and other things that I love when I'm preaching here. But I do love sci-fi. But the truth is, the reason we want to go to Mars and the moon is because we think being on Earth is too dangerous. We have to save ourselves. We need to spread our seed across the universe if we have any hope for humanity to survive. This is the desperate attempt of humanity to save itself. It is salvation by works. And for some reason, we think ourselves capable of achieving it. However, as Christians, we're meant to know that the Christian scriptures insist that we cannot save ourselves. Nor have we been left alone to do so. But even that truth, which Christians have preserved in the world, has not left us immune from deceptions that lead to death. Many Christians have convinced themselves that we can have faith in Jesus in our hearts without the need for following him with our bodies. The people in Amos' day felt exactly the same. There's nothing new under the sun in that respect. That's how the ancients felt as well. They thought that so long as they were worshipping the right God, they had the right name after all, they were worshipping Yahweh, what did it matter how they chose to worship Him? Maybe Baal worshippers had something cool that we could just incorporate into the worship of Yahweh. We're not rejecting Yahweh, we're just adding something neat that another culture explored and understood. Why can't we add a little dancing and cutting of ourselves to this thing? Why can't we just do a little flair to the animal sacrifices? Do we really need these priests? Can't everybody be the same? And they innovated. The covenant of Sinai is really more like a guide, right? It's not like a law or anything like that. God's just suggesting some things. But we have to decide. Both such people, the people in Amos' day and Christians today, they've remembered that we are saved by grace, by the compassion and mercy of God, that we're not saved by works. Both groups know that God has not saved us because we earned the privilege, and both are right in that conviction. Even the greatest of human achievements... Even if you and I could manage to be perfect specimens of humanity on earth, that would never merit God granting us eternal life. What could a human do to earn eternal life? Our comparison to God would be similar to a single cell organism in comparison to you. Even greater a distance. What could amoeba do to earn your right to give it life forever? What could it do? We could never earn it. Of course, it's by grace. But both groups have forgotten that though we are saved by grace, God has determined that this salvation must be through faith in Him. It must have feet. In other words, God's offer is not unconditional. It's not without conditions. The condition set by God is faith. And Jesus defined faith by following Him by walking with God. 
You'd be a fool to believe Noah was righteous by some universal standard of goodness compared to God. He wasn't righteous because of that. He was righteous because he walked with God. And so must we. I hope today that you can join me in the great hope of the gospel, that God relented from destroying everything in the flood because one family of humans was not enough for him. Because one man, his wife, and his three sons was not enough. God's house was full. He wanted it to be full. The tables were set and he invited the earth and only one family came to his first invitation. All the rest of the earth went their own way. And so God had to wipe them out, but he did not want to give up. He had the great hope that his house would be full. And so he spared the earth. He withdrew the waters before they destroyed the whole thing. And he started over and he went in with Abraham and he began to choose a people through whom he could reveal himself and through whom he would call the world to himself. And and then he took on flesh in the person of Jesus personally so that he with his own voice not through the mouth of a prophet not through the mouth of a of a great sage somewhere not even through a culture but by his own voice he could call humanity to repentance and to return to him and through Jesus billions have come the scriptures tell us that the throng that gathers around his throne who have washed their robes white in the blood of Jesus is beyond counting. But where are they today? For those of us who have placed our faith in this God by denying ourselves, taking up our crosses and following Jesus, we are journeying together into a world without waters. A world in which we will dwell with God and discover with Him all that we were meant to do and to be and to become. This world is a womb. You've not yet even seen the real world. You are still in the womb. And the threat of the scriptures is that many who are conceived here will be still born here. Only the people of God will be born into the real world. And that's being born again. If you share that hope with me, do not give up. Persevere. He is still a God of chesed, and he will do as he promised. Even though we stand now in the midst of the judgment of God on the church, and on the nations of the earth. Even though we now feel the birth pangs of this place, probably more severely than any generation that's lived before us, even though the imminence of God's judgment is all around us, God will and always has preserved a remnant. As Amos has prophesied, God has told us that days are coming when I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and they will rebuild the desolated cities and live in them. This is the great promise of God to us. So stand fast, people of God. Do not compromise his word or his faith out of fear of those who control this world and what they think of you. Because this world is for fire. The God we must answer to, his kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom cannot be found here. It's not to be found in a constitution or a covenant written by human beings. It's not to be found in a nation on the earth or a religion that has great cathedrals. The kingdom of God is not of this world. It is coming, and we are ambassadors of that kingdom, sent as it exiles into the world, and we forgot ourselves. We tried to build his kingdom here when only God can build his kingdom, and it is not here. He builds no kingdoms in the fire. The new heavens and the new earth are coming. Jesus is now in the heavens establishing his kingdom. And that kingdom will come and purge the earth. And God will do this. So stand fast. Do not give up. But if you are akin to those of whom Amos spoke in verse 10, 
If you're of those who have traded the promises of God for the temporary pleasures of this place, if you've come to believe things about God because of your fear of what people will think of you, if you've denied Jesus because you are afraid of standing and being counted with him, if you're afraid of the death sentence, if you're afraid of the condemnation that will come on you if you stand up for your Lord, if you're afraid that the same sentence given to him of hate, and disdain, and eventually execution, if you are trying to avoid that by the things you say you believe, you're in trouble. If you've been deceived by the wisdom of the world and oftentimes the teachings of the church, that God expects faith without feet, that God accepts belief without trust, if God is pleased by vain repetition without the fruit of the Spirit being born in the soul of His people, then please change your direction. Turn around. It is not too late to follow Jesus. These things are not worth it. They're not worth it. The acceptance of the world is not worth it. The pleasure of sinners is not worth it. These things pave a road that leads back to the waters, back to the dust from whence we came. We must release these things. We must do what Jesus told the rich young ruler to do when he said, how can I inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, obey the commandments. That is the beginning, right? Show that you trust God by actually putting into practice the thing God has instructed you to do. And the man said, Good news, I did that. I have put those things into practice. Is that all I need? And Jesus says, one thing you lack. Sell everything you have. Give it away and follow me. You cannot follow him if you're holding on to this place. This building, this town, your legacy, your values, nothing. You must give it all. When God's judgment comes, the ones he saves are those who are walking with Jesus. And Jesus had no house, right? He gave it up in his ministry. No place to lay his head. He went where God asked him. Let Jesus show you who you really are and who you are truly to become in him. The day of the Lord is at hand. We have no more time. Let's follow Jesus.